Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about the work that my students and colleagues and I are doing. And I'm going to concentrate mostly on the work that we're doing in trying to use AR to explain stuff to people, and especially to explain stuff to people who are not in the same room with you, to allow people to remotely assist folks who are actually on site performing a task of some sort. But before I do that, what I wanted to do is something that I was surprised no one had done yet this morning, which is to actually try to define to you AR, and I'm going to do it in terms of VR. So when we use the phrase VR, we're referring to a computer-generated world. It's full of virtual media of various sorts, not just things you see. That stuff is 3D, it's interactive, and it's tracked relative to the user. And I've exemplified that with our uh, infamous Oculus Rift fish face picture over there of someone all locked in and clearly looking at something that he obviously finds exciting. So one is augmented reality. It's all of the above, except this virtual stuff is registered in 3D with the perceptible real world. And by registered, I mean that it is geometrically aligned, it is photometrically aligned, and ideally, at least, it should look to you as if it were really actually there. Now, one thing that I've done in my last sentence, but I tried not to do in the definitions, is I went from being completely, totally, uh, uh, atheistic in terms of the modality, the media, to being kind of visually chauvinistic. I use the term look, okay? But although most of what I'm going to talk about, most of what folks here are going to talk about are things that are visual, AR in general doesn't refer just to things you see. It's also things you can hear, things you can feel, smell, taste, etc. Okay? But again, as I said, I'm going to talk mostly about things that are visual. So in my lab, we have for a while been working on user interfaces for augmented reality. Um, we've looked at a variety of domains, navigation. You're seeing on the left over here a big bulky backpack system that we used starting in the mid-90s to be able to overlay graphics on top of the view that you had of the world around you. In games and entertainment, like this uh, a virtual Marvel game where we're tracking a handheld patterned uh, piece of board to create a virtual Marvel maze. Or one thing that I said I was going to concentrate on, which is task assistance, assisting people in performing skilled tasks. So what do I mean by that? In particular, I'm interested in, nowadays, in remote task assistance. And so there is a standard kind of trope, uh, 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 really a meme, if anything, um, in the industrial world in which in many, many different kinds of domains, you have this notion of a local person performing a task and then a remote person whom you'd like to have help that local person. That remote person known as a SME in industry, short for subject matter expert, um, is someone who typically is going to be older, wiser. They might not want to travel, and they're going to be trying to help as much as possible this often younger, less skilled, boots on the ground person who's actually performing a task. And so in the work that we're doing, um, we see basically uh, two main goals that we're trying to assist our remote SME in performing. One of them is helping the tech, we'll call uh, the person who's actually performing the task a tech or technician for short. Um, we want to get them in the right place, at the right position, looking in the right direction to be able to go and do the things that they need to do, see the things they need to see. That's the where. And the second is the how, which is we need to go and get that tech to actually perform the task correctly. So I'm going to show you a little bit of some of the stuff that my lab has been doing in trying to address these problems using augmented reality. The first thing I'm going to mention is the getting in place. And what you're seeing here is a still from a video I'm going to show you shortly, in which you're seeing a a uh, small desktop size scaled down um, model of an aircraft engine, the full version of which we actually have in the corner of our lab. And the hand of the expert is being used to point out these little iconic representations of a view that we would like to have our technician uh, acquire. And that means we want to get our technician to go to a particular place in the environment relative to the full scale engine. And when our expert selects one of these little iconic representations of a view, 
What the technician is going to see, and this is a view through one eye of a augmented reality display, you're seeing at the left part of that full-size uh, aircraft engine, and then on the right you're seeing a kind of splayed picture frame window, and in this work we put up a virtual window in the environment, virtual picture frame, and the idea is you're going to look through it. So let's see what that looks like. And so here we see our expert, third-party view. Now we're going to see a view through the eyes of the expert. In this case, this is an augmented reality view. You can see some of the real world. You can see this little virtual representation being spun around on a Lazy Susan of the engine model. And now he's going to select one of those viewpoints. And here we see our technician wearing a video see-through AR display look through the window, and the reason he knew to do that is he's seeing in the environment this splayed picture frame that he's going to go and stick his head through. And then when he looks through it, which is where our expert wants him to be, he'll see the expert's hand with a long kind of Pinocchio nose pointer coming off the end, pointing at something of interest. So this is work we did a couple of years ago. And in the process of doing it, we began to realize that if I tell you to look through this window, people take different responses to it. Some folks will just walk right up to it and stick their head into it. Other folks have been to lots of art museums, and if they got that close to a painting, the guard's going to scream at them. So they sort of like step back a bit, and they have this very sort of healthy distance from the window. So what we wanted to do is to really be able to constrain where we had that person go. And we didn't want to simply say, go exactly over here and look in exactly that direction, because there are many experiences in which you don't need that specificity. I can, for example, as I'm doing right now, walk around on this stage. These are all perfectly reasonable things for me to do. I can look in a variety of directions right now. Those are all fine. On the other hand, me standing over here in the back looking at the rear end of the auditorium, I mean, this doesn't make a lot of sense. So there's some things that work and some things that don't. We wanted to be able to give people an idea of what that range is. This is an example of something we've done a little bit more recently. And this thing, which looks like an airbag in the process of being deployed, is a representation we call a parafrostum of this range of good places to be and range of good directions to look. In this case, that big yellow thing is a target, and we want to have our person put their head inside of it. They're going to see this in their environment, and they're simply going to go and just thrust their head into it. When their head's inside, depending upon its size and position, they're in a good place. And then there is another one of these little volumes. This one's small in this case. And that one needs to be in the right place relative to what they're seeing. So what's the right place? I'll show you that in a couple of seconds. I'm going to show you a little video shot through one eye of this head-worn display that's going to show you the visual feedback we give you to get you to go into the right place and look in the right direction. As I said, a collection of right places and a collection of right directions. There we are. So now you're seeing a video shot through one eye. Our user is going to stick their head in there. As soon as that yellow disappears and these blue ribs go away, everything's fine. But now they're going to stick their head right out the other side. That's bad. This is getting big and red and angry. No good. And now they're going to cut it on the sides. That's also no good, as those white bars are showing you. And when we move back in and put ourselves back inside, now everything is fine. You can see that thin red outline over there. These are all good. And now we'll pull our head out. And so this turns out to let us let you be told a range of these possibilities for situations in which you don't need to be exactly at one place looking exactly in one direction. So once you've gotten the person in the right place, we need to have them perform the task. And so in this case, you're looking at a technician who in this case uh, is looking at two parts of a aircraft combustion chamber. And there's a task that's going to involve putting the top part on top of the bottom part in the right orientation. And so what we're going to do, basically, is have that person perform this task. And I'm going to show you how we actually have our remote expert show them what to do. Now, the view that our local person gets okay, is what you're seeing over here. Um, and this is a view through a so-called video see-through display. We're looking through two cameras that are embedded in the eyes uh, of the head-worn display. You're seeing on the left a view through one of those cameras. 
real bottom part of this combustion chamber, on the left, real top part on the right. And on top of the real bottom part is a virtual representation of the top part placed there by the remote expert. And there's some rubber band lines, um, virtual rubber band lines that stretch between the two so that you can make sure you get the orientation right when you pick up the real uh, top part and place it on the real bottom part, as you're seeing being done uh, in the view on the right over there. So let's see how this actually uh, gets accomplished. Um, so our local tech is seeing things in AR. Our remote SME is seeing things in VR. And the reason we're doing that is we want to have the remote SME not actually have to have any of the physical equipment there. We want them to be able to work, for example, not at a company, but maybe from home. Maybe there's someone who's retired, and they've been willing to, on a very regular basis, or a regular one, spend a little time at home doing some of the things that they used to do so that the 35 years of experience they had when they retired didn't just walk out the door and the company can still benefit from them. And they, as well, at the same time, can enjoy, literally, if you don't do it all the time, the experience of really being useful. So local tech in AR, remote SME in VR, and the remote SME has copies of, tracked copies, of everything the local person is manipulating. Because in our work, we are tracking each one of those parts in its full position and orientation. So again, if we can get the next slide over there. So now we're going to see what our remote SME does. You're going to see a view on the screen of the uh, two eyes. Side-by-side uh, -side stereo view of what they're seeing in the head-worn display they're wearing. If you can get me the next slide, please. And so now what they're going to do is they're going to pick up that top to put it on the bottom. And you notice when they picked it up, they picked up a clone of it. Because if they actually tried moving virtually the real thing, then it would be uh, off-kilter with. It would not be consistent and synchronized with what the technician was doing. So when they pick something up to move it, to manipulate it, they're going to pick up a copy and do that with the copy. And now we see our local technician's view. And what's going to happen when I start the video is you're going to see that that uh, virtual version on top of the uh, real uh, bottom part of the combustion chamber is going to jiggle a little bit because the remote expert is still in the process of placing it, positioning and orienting it as the technician can begin to actually do their task. And so because it is virtual, they can really be working in the same space at the same time, something that, in fact, would really be hard to do if they were physically co-located and working with a real part. So if I can have the uh, next slide, please. So you're seeing that left part still jiggling, moving around a little bit as our SME is uh, positioning it and orienting it. And now our local technician is putting their physical part in place over there. So one final thing I'm going to mention, if I can get the next slide, wow, that actually worked, um, is in my lab, we build things like this. We design um, the different kinds of visualizations we're showing you. And then we run studies to see how well they work. And in this case, you're going to see another representation. This is a condition in which the SME is sketching annotations on a tablet. This is much more like what people are starting to do in industry right now. And this is our baseline with which we could compare this notion of really having that SME be able to physically manipulate things in, in 3D. And so if I can have the next slide. So here we're sketching. And because the system knows about where things are in 3D, that's the SME's view as they're smetching on the tablet. But now you'll see what the text sees, a representation of the SME's head as they're rotating. And all those little annotations have been sent into 3D, so they're actually on the virtual parts. Now, to make a very long story short, we did a user study. I'm not going to go into the details of the slide. But we studied a variety of different ways of using AR to be able to go and communicate information. And it turned out that, that the technique I showed you, where the SME was manipulating things, was significantly faster for them to do than that sketching technique that I just showed you. So last thing I want to mention is work we're doing on what comes next. So what happens when we really have head-worn displays that are lightweight, that are inexpensive, with incredible tracking, wide field of view, enabling us to be able to go and do the sorts of things that we do right now in research on an everyday basis? Now, I don't believe that the wonderful head-worn displays that we're going to have mean that everything else is going to go away. The same technologies that make them wonderful are 
and similar technologies are going to make it possible for us to have, as we used to get to see in cartoons when we were little kids, wallpaper and paint that literally will cover every surface imaginable with things that will be interactive. So I'll have carpets that will be displays, walls that will be displays, ceilings that will be displays. All walls and ceilings and carpets may well be displays. Okay? When we have stuff like that, not necessarily the case that you simply going to get rid of them. They're going to happen, and they're going to be really useful. And so I'm very interested in how we can make the really cool headwear displays of the future play well with all that other technology, things you hold in your hands, things that are literally built into tabletops and the rest of the environmental infrastructure. What you're seeing here is an example of some work in which there is a rear projected tabletop, but there are building models that you see above it. They violate the bezels of that tabletop because they're being seen through a video see-through display in this urban visualization example. Um, let me show you another one, if I can have the next slide. Um, this is work done by a student, Pierre Amelo, who was in my lab for a couple of months uh, last year. Um, and what we're doing here is the same kind of what we call hybrid user interface, in which in this case, we're going to be seeing a little music application, music browsing application. There is a HoloLens that you're going to be seeing things through, providing AR. There is a uh, flat panel, uh, perceptive pixel display from Microsoft. It's very, very responsive, uh, large screen, multi-touch, multi-finger uh, interface. And there's also a leap motion controller that's just at the very bottom of the bezel. You'll see it a little bit if you look carefully in the videos, which is going to let us actually do multi-hand interaction of the sort that HoloLens doesn't support right now. And so if I can get the thing running, there's some audio on this. So our user is just swiping through, selecting Michael Jackson. And now you see, because they're all in the same coordinate system, the HoloLens graphics is uh, basically going to be aligned with the stuff on the perceptive pixel display. So here we have Daft Punk. We can click on it. And now we can do some two-handed gestures to be able to go and uh, essentially scroll through the, the albums that are there. And if we see one that we like, we can reach out and grab it, courtesy again of the Leap Motion Controller. Make our list a little bit bigger. Play song. Select a song, and then listen to it being played in this case through Spotify as we continue to go and browse and explore more stuff. So I'm going to pause that. I think I've reached the end of the talk. I acknowledge the many students and colleagues and funding agencies that have been responsible for the work that you just saw. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk.